Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Areas Center webinar series, host, sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, and I'll be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar, which is titled Developing Offshore Wind in U.S. Waters Part 1, the Planning and Regulatory Framework, and will be presented by Betsy Nicholson, Joy Page, and Brian Hooker. As a North Regional Director for NOAA's Office of Coastal Management, Betsy works with her team extending from the Great Lakes through the North Atlantic to provide municipal, state, and regional partners with technology, information, and management strategies to address complex issues such as resilience to coastal hazards and changing ocean demands. Betsy offers specific expertise in ocean planning, policy, and management, and previously served as the federal lead of the Northeast Regional Planning Body, developing the first regional ocean plan in the nation. She's also currently the federal co-chair and NOAA representative to the Northeast Regional Ocean Council. Betsy started with NOAA in 2000, and during her tenure at Was in Washington, served as the National Ocean Service liaison, liaison to the NOAA Administrator and as the NOAA Policy Advisor to the Secretary of Commerce. She received a Master's in Coastal Environmental Manager from Duke University and a Bachelor of Arts from Williams College. Joy Page is a Management Program Analyst for the Duke Department of Energy, Wind Energy Technology Office. In this role, she's responsible for overseeing the WETO's investment in understanding and addressing challenges to wind energy development related to environmental impacts, community effects, and workforce needs. Her career is focused on addressing renewable energy and wildlife concerns for nearly two decades. Prior to her work at WETO, Joy led Defenders of Wildlife's Renewable Energy Program, where she collaborated with government agencies and developers on policies and strategies to minimize and mitigate wildlife impacts from renewable energy development. Prior to that, she practiced law on the environment and energy team at Godfrey and Kane SC, where she advised clients on a range of complex environmental permitting and corporate transactional matters. Joy received her Juris Doctor degree from Georgetown University Law Center and has a Master's in Science and Environmental Health from the University of Illinois and a Bachelor of Science from Bradley University. Last but not least, Brian began working with BOEM's Office of Renewable Energy Programs in 2010 to aid in the assessment and study of environmental impacts from offshore renewable energy along the U.S. Atlantic seaboard. His area of expertise at BOEM is around protected species, essential fish habitat, and commercial and recreational fishing. He now leads a team at BOEM that is responsible for Endangered Species Act and Management and Stevens Conservation Act consultations and National Environment Policy Environmental Policy Assessment Support. As you can see, we have a very qualified set of panelists here today, and we're very excited to have Betsy, Joy, and Brian here. But before I turn it over to <clears throat> before I turn it over to Betsy, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions in the questions box. It's found at the bottom of your control panel, often found at the top right corner of your screen, and we'll pose the questions to the panelists at the end of the presentation. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Betsy. Thank you, Zach. All right. Can you give me a thumbs up or just tell me if you can see my screen? I'm good. Great, wonderful. Hey, hello, everybody. Thank you for so much interest. Really honored to be here with my colleagues, Joy and Brian. And thank you to the MPA Center and to Octo for putting this on. So we're excited to talk about offshore wind today, but before we do that, we thought it would be really valuable just to take a few minutes to set the stage on how the past four administrations have advanced ocean planning and management in a way that positions us very well to focus on this single ocean use offshore wind in a thoughtful way. Okay, so starting, going back to Bush, um, uh, W. So thinking of Bush as Bush administration as the envisioning administration. So here we had we, the, we had the Energy Policy Act of 05, and I know Brian's going to talk about this as well, but that really um, set the stage for diversifying our nation's energy supply, including renewables, and gave BOEM the authority um, for renewable energy development in federal waters. But what also happened during this administration were two very important commissions that really helped us think broadly about all the mandates, all the uses, all the, the responsibilities um, and, and the services that that the ocean provides. So the Ocean Commission and the Pew Ocean Commission, as well as the Oceans Act, helped us do that. And really what those commissions were grappling with was the challenge of like 140 different laws. 
that were uh, govern our oceans and that were passed at different times without any real overarching comprehensive piece of ocean legislation that helped us determine what goes where and how we balance all of these needs in an ocean space. Uh, we, those commissions considered ecosystem-based management. And this is just, just an example of some of those um, ecosystem services that we're all interested in, including energy. So they set us up for the Obama administration. Those recommendations did. And I call this the administration of designing and planning. And so here, we have a real opportunity to bring some of the commission's work to life. We have the Ocean Council structure that was set up with heads of agencies of all the ocean ocean agencies in the uh, executive branch, um, all working together to design an ocean policy that really focused on coastal and marine spatial planning. And that directed us to take a look beyond our single sector authorities at what's going on out there on the ocean, in the ocean, and how to reconcile all of these mandates that we have responsibility for executing in the same space. So what this, what this administration really did was push us to take a regional approach. And, um, and we set up these regional planning bodies. I was involved in the Northeast, for example, where we really had the opportunity to sit alongside tribes, states, fishery management councils, ocean users, the interested public, and really dig into what we value, what kind of, what kind of ocean build out we want to see, what kind of ocean conservation we want to see. Um, and a couple of regions, the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic completed those and approved those ocean plans within that administration. Um, and they really created a bit of a blueprint of best practices that I think are really applicable now. So for example, the ocean plan in the Northeast really focused on making data accessible, right? And committing federal agencies to using that information in their decisions, no matter what their mandate or ocean use that they're, that they're concerned with. It helped us figure out how to identify conflicts, compatibilities, and affected people to work together and also to identify what we still need to understand. So a really important practical step forward that we did in the context of ocean offshore wind. Um, if you remember, we had Cape Wind that was going on for about 12 years there, but then we also had the Block Island Wind Project in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, both doing their own ocean planning processes where we really were able to look and see how a solid ocean planning process with the data and the inclusivity and the transparency um, really lent itself to choosing appropriate sites for offshore wind. And this all created an expectation for that transparency, for that accountability um, that I think are continue to be important today. So then we get to Trump. And although some of that ocean planning work um, took a pause, we actually had a real opportunity to augment data in this administration. And I point to a particular study that Boehm and NOAA and others were very involved in that allowed us to go back to all of those regions that were involved under the ocean policy in Obama and ground truth, the most important data themes that we need accessible and usable through the marine cadaster, for example, that's co-led by Boehm and NOAA um, as the authoritative uh, mothership of data, right? Think of it that way. We need this kind of data to inform offshore wind, to inform other ocean uses. And we were able to make a lot of progress during Trump to get a lot of that data accessible. And then we get to Biden, right? And I call this sort of the, the applying to projects administration, where now we have an ocean policy committee that's still focused on ocean co-use, right? Still that thrust that we saw under, under Obama but also some really specific goal, goals under for conservation and for wind, including floating offshore wind. And Joy's gonna go into a little bit more of this in a minute, but just to come back to the fact that we are now still using these same best practices for ocean permitting and management that we discovered under Obama and even earlier, the importance of inclusive outreach and engagement, of collaboration across agencies and in, interjurisdictionally, accessible and credible data and coordination early and often with applicants so that um, we put these kinds of best practices in play for wind, but also for a lot of other types of projects that continue to happen um, alongside offshore wind. So all of those lessons continue to be um, really important to put into use. And, and just want to end here with a comment that here we are with these incredible 
administration goals around renewable energy, that's really allowed us and pushed us, particularly NOAA, into an era of next generation marine spatial planning, where we're able now to use that data that we've that we've worked across so many agencies and partners with to, to make accessible and put that in a modeling context where now we're really interested in site suitability modeling for a particular use, and that is offshore wind. I'm sure Brian will mention this too in terms of our partnership with BOEM on this, but this has become a really important way to continue being inclusive, being credible, being transparent about the information we're using to site wind. Final slide here is just to point out the fact that you know, we've been through a lot of administrations here. We don't know if we're gonna get another term for Biden or whether we're gonna be in a new administration, but regardless, we can continue to make progress in ocean planning and management. And here are some principles that we've learned, right? Can, don't, you know, don't forget to continue to focus on the credible data and science to maintain those forums where we're discussing larger scale ocean issues. Um, to institutionalize these best practices within our agency mandates and maintain those relationships that really create accountability with each other to do, to do it this way, as well as to track our progress. How are we doing? How is this going? And really have a dialogue. And that's part of what today is about, right? In subsequent webinars is to take stock of where we are, um, particularly with this, this major challenge um, in front of us for renewable energy. And with that, I will turn it over to Joy. Great. Right. Thank you, Betsy. Let's see if I get this up. Switch there. All right. How does that look, Betsy? Looks great. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as uh, Zach mentioned in the beginning, my name is Joy Page, and I am a management and program analyst at DOE. And I am lucky to oversee our workforce, environmental, and community engagement portfolios at DOE. Uh, though today I'm going to really talk big picture, uh, but just wanted to share what my focus is. And really, the last 10 years has really been focused on the environmental side. So I'm quickly getting up to speed on the other two. Uh, I wanted to frame uh, my conversation in talking about DOE's motivations and objectives uh, around the Ocean Climate Action Plan, which I assume many of you on the call uh, are familiar with. And so this administration, and, and Betsy, I loved how you walked through the administrations just now, it's a, it's a helpful frame, has really made clear that climate change is a real threat to our communities, economy, and security, and that there's an urgent and transformative, um, or there's an urgent need for transformative action really at all levels of government. And the administration also makes clear that our oceans hold a lot of potential to tackle the threat of climate change. Uh, and, and the, the action plan itself is really a call for action across all of our agencies, BOEM, NOAA, DOE, and others. And I really like, how, like to frame it here because uh, it really stitches together why Betsy, Brian, and I are on this call together. Uh, and the OCAP, which we like to call it because everything is an acronym, really outlines three goals, which I'm going to make sure I, I get right here. Uh, the first is to create a carbon neutral future without harmful emissions that cause climate change. The second is to accelerate nature-based solutions to protect and support natural coastal and ocean systems. And the third is to enhance community resilience to climate change. Uh, and under those, those three sort of objectives, they outline six actions. And the first is to provide 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments uh, to disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities. And we call this our Justice 40 Initiative. The second is something that really guides DOE's work, and that's deploy 30 gigawatts of energy of offshore wind by 2030. The third is to deploy 15 gigawatts of energy from floating offshore wind by 2035. And just to, to clarify, these aren't necessarily additives. We're not saying 2045, or we're not saying 45 by 2035, though we hope we get there. Um, they're two separate goals. Uh, the fourth being conserve at least 30% of US lands and waters by 2030. This is the 30 by 30 initiative or, or America the Beautiful. Uh, we love 30 by 30 in the federal government. Uh, the, the fifth being identifying opportunities for scaling up nature-based solutions to address climate change, strengthen communities and support local, commun local economies. And then the final, achieve working with countries in the International Maritime Organization, zero greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping no later than 2050. Um, 
So I think this plan is it's a great focus for us and it, and it guides DOE's work as well as BOEM and NOAA. And so now I want to focus is what is DOE focused on now? Um, you saw that that 30 by 30 goal that that really guides all of our work and it, it charts where are we going to be investing our resources into transformative science technology demonstration and deployment uh, to reach that 30 gigawatt goal by 2030 and, and to set the nation on a longer term path of 110 gigawatts by no more than 20. Uh, and more, sorry, by 2050. I put the, the long URL here if you want to see DOE's offshore strategy, uh, but if you just Google it, you can find it as well. Uh, and, and in this goal, we really chart out a vision, and this is, this is more or less what I think of as our investment strategy. Uh, and the vision is a future in which offshore wind is a critical part of the nation's decarbonized energy sector and climate solution. And there's, there's three stools to this goal, the one naturally being economic, and this is, you know, that it's cost competitive with alternative sources of fuel, good paying and meaningful, good paying and meaningful employment, uh, the U.S. being a leader in global export of components and services, and then for floating offshore wind, which I'll talk about a little more at the end, uh, making U.S. leadership in design, manufacturing, and deployment. Second, obviously, reliable. Reliable energy is very important to us, so making sure that it's near near load and that we actually have transmission to carry that energy. And the third, again, which is where I spend most of my time, making sure that it's sustainable, just, and timely. And I really think this is just as critical as the other two because we all know that we're not going to have a sustainable energy source unless it's just and timely, um, including thinking about impacts to marine resources and habitats, circular economy and recyclable materials, uh, really focusing more on the impacts and benefits for communities, uh, ocean co-use, and then coordinated and efficient permitting. And so our offshore wind strategy is focused in, in four parts. We call them now, which is fixed bottom because we're already deploying commercial scale fixed bottom in the Atlantic. Uh, second is forward, and that's in our floating offshore wind space on the Pacific and in certain parts of the Atlantic and the Great Lakes. Um, and that's something we're working towards. Connect, which is ensuring that we have reliable and real resilient transmission. And then finally transform, which is co-generation of things like hydrogen. And I wanted to quickly show you, um, if you wanted to get a sense of where we're gonna see fixed bottoms versus floating, you can see we have tremendous resources uh, floating mostly on the West fixed of near shore on the Atlantic. And when I say near shore, it's still pretty far off. Um, and, and as a Midwesterner, I always fascinating that much of the Great Lakes will be floating offshore wind. Uh, the second thing I wanted to, to reference you to is DOE's energy earth shots. Uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, these are really cool in initiatives by DOE to really drive integrated program development across DOE science and applied energy offices. Uh, in focusing on uh, climate, addressing climate change. And what's great is that the secretary really sends a message across DOE offices, not just to the Wind Energy Technology Office, to stress that this is a high priority. And so the goal for our floating offshore wind shot is to drive leadership um, in design, manufacturing, and deployment with a greater than 70% cost reduction to be achieved by 2035. Uh, on the same day that we announced our, our shot, BOEM also announced that that deployment goal of 15 gigawatts of floating offshore wind by 2035. And again, we, we're not seeing commercial scale floating offshore wind the way we are fixed bottom. So this really gives a great opportunity for the U.S. to get in front and really become a, a global leader. And once again, we outline our key needs. Much of these mimic the, the greater uh, offshore wind strategy I mentioned earlier. Uh, with cost reductions being the first pillar, expanded just and sustainable deployment, again, being incredibly critical to this work, domestic supply chains, including ports, um, there will be significant port modernization that will be needed to achieve this goal, transmission development, as well as co-generation applications. And so then I just wanted to leave you with this image of just what these floating offshore wind platforms look like in comparison to the White House. And then I think I'm handing this off to Brian. Thanks, Joy. That was great. Let's 
see here. And there. How's that look, Joy? Or anyone? All right. Looking good. Looking good. All right. Thanks. I thought I could unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, Kevin. All right. So that was a great introduction from Betsy and uh, Joy on a lot of the policy, uh, the, the policy framework, and uh, that we we have in place. Uh, I'm going to uh, really try to dive into uh, the regulatory framework that we're op operating. Hey, in. Brian. Um, it flicked back to your presenter mode. Oh, now it's good. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Good That's weird. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. Um, so real quick, you know, you know, where are we right now um, with actual deployment and and projects in the in the pipeline? Um, so the as I was mentioned, the Energy Policy Act, which gave Boehm its authority, was uh, published in um, 2005, and then we published the regulations in 2009, and then we had our first round of offshore wind energy leases in the 2011 to 2015 time uh, 2015 time. 2015 timeframe, and as you can see, even with those first leases occurring in like the you know as early as 2011, um, the far left of this graph shows you what's actually operating on the outer continental shelf. Well, and this isn't even just the outer continental shelf. This includes uh, a state waters project, um, the Block Island Wind Farm project, um, <clears throat> off of uh, off of Rhode Island, in the far left. So we have. You know, only about 40 uh, megawatts uh, deployed and operating. Under construction is where we are right now. This number we have two projects that are that are under construction right now. And then, where I'm spending a lot of my time and what we'll talk about is in, in this uh, permitting category. And then, you know, behind that is areas that we've leased but haven't entered the permitting process. So site control. And then there's a total pipeline even behind that. So we're still in the very early stages. Like I said, you know, only two demonstration scale projects actually built and two commercial scale projects uh, under active uh, construction as of today. So as we mentioned, uh, the outer, what the Energy Policy Act did, it, it was amending the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that allows for, uh, gives Boehm the authority on the Outer Continental Shelf. So that's basically three miles to around you know, 200 miles offshore um, for energy. And what the Energy Policy Act has said, okay, that's not only minerals and oil and gas, but also alternative energy, including renewable energy. Again, our statutory authority uh, kind of mimics and uh, put in place a lot of the uh, requirements that we need including the protection of the environment, prevention of waste, um, and prevention of interference with other, other reasonable uses. These are all uh, core principles that are put forth in, the, in statute and adopted in our regulations. So in our regulations, they're, if they're, they're there for anyone to, to look at. They're in um, thir the Code of Federal Regulations Part 30, um, Section 30, Part uh, 585. Um, and so they they contain the process for obtaining the lease, financial assurance requirements, um, requirements for the contents of plans. So the terms you might hear me use is a, a site assessment plan, which is for uh, assessing the wind energy um, at the at the site, um, and a construction and operations plan. That's the the main plan that we get and review uh, for the actual construction of a commercial uh, scale project, and then. Lastly, I mean, there's a lot of other things in, in our regulations as well, but we also do have measures for uh, lease cancellation as well outlined in, in our regulations. One thing I won't get too much into it, um, in, in there, uh, in my presentation slides today is uh, the decommissioning application. So I just, there was always the, the idea of like really looking at the full life cycle of from lease issuance all the way to decommissioning throughout our regulations. And uh, the decommissioning application guidelines are, are also in there. So where are we right now? So we've completed um, about nine competitive lease sales. Uh, act, you know, 
18 uh, commercial uh, offshore leases issued. Um, we have, I mentioned, uh, two active research leases. Site assessment plans, again, that's the uh, plans for uh, assessing wind energy, 14 of those approved. General activities plans, that's the uh, basically the research uh, lease. And where we are uh, with our construction operations plan, so we've got two approved. Uh, well, I get this just <laughs> got it. Um, we just issued the ROD for another one, so that's a third, and we just issued the FEIS and ROD for another one. So this is slide's already uh, a little outdated. And then another 12 under review and five anticipated. We also uh, issue guidance to lessees for how to, uh, you know, interpreting our regulations and what the information needs requirements are in our construction and operations plans or even in um, site assessment plans. And so we have over 11 guidance documents that we've issued uh, to lessees as well. And lastly, uh, leasing under consideration, this is at the planning uh, area analysis. We have a, a, well, approximately six areas under leasing consideration. And the first steel in federal waters was the um, Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, uh, two turbines in 2020. So what is our process? Uh, a, a lot of those um, uh, core values that Betsy referred to under uh, the ocean policy uh, planning process were adopted into the uh, BOEMS process. So BOEM um, uses really a, a state, uh, start off with a state task force uh, process. So the it's the states that ultimately issue the power purchase agreements or issue what uh, their renewable energy goals and procurements are going to be. So we partner very closely with the states that have a desire to purchase offshore uh, wind energy or renewable energy. Um, so in the early days, that was pretty much between a you know particular state that had a goal and and Boehm. Since then, we really branched out into regional task forces because we realized that their um, the power is not being uh, obtained just from an area off that particular state, but uh, you know we may be able to transmit over longer distances. So we've developed um, a regional uh, task force approach. But the first step in all this is a request for information or a call for information and nominations. Uh, that's when we first reach out and and say, hey, you know, this is what we're um, what we're thinking about uh, leasing. And even more recently, we've we've done um, draft calls for nom uh, for information and nominations. So again, trying to introduce as many public opportunities into the process as possible. And then eventually we get into uh, the leasing. The leasing process. Most of our leases are competitively uh, leased, so there's an auction um, where the leases are are issued. And then once a lessee has a lease, then they, they can enter into the what we term the site assessment pro, pro, uh, term. That's when they do a lot of the site characterization work, you know, uh, going out and doing surveys of the lease site, trying to identify what how the site might be developed, and also assessing uh, the wind energy potential from the site. And then lastly, it, we enter the construction operations term, and that begins when a construction operations plan is submitted and deemed uh, complete. And that's where we are right now with a lot of projects is actually doing our environmental review and consultations um, for construction and operations plan. Again, lastly, is, and then once BOEM approves the COP, then installation may continue um, after that. But there's a lot of other permits from a lot of different federal other federal agencies that also need to occur before that installation happens as well. So I did want to touch a little bit on how the area identification process for how we winnow. I, I, uh, so when we started with that request for information uh, stage, we start we generally start with a pretty broad area to uh, begin that uh, process of trying to say, okay, we know we want you know, approximately this much amount of energy from an area. Um, some of the site may not be uh, best suited for different reasons. And let's start big and, and then we go down into ever smaller areas. So the planning area is is generally the smallest. Um, <clears throat> then we go into a, a call area and uh, 
then we finally get to what we determine is a wind energy area. And then even within that, there may be lease areas that are a subset of that. And as Betsy actually mentioned in the beginning, um, in recent years, we've been working very closely with NOAA's NCOS group to um, really help with uh, a lot of the, the data integration uh, across uh, the, each of these, these steps from planning all the way to, to lease issuance um, as far as like, you know, really having a trans, trying to work on a transparent process to show the public all the different data sets and all the different data layers that are going into um, our BOEM's determination of what areas we might actually put out for auction at the end of this planning process. So I thought I might start with uh, an example. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we started uh, in this Rhode Island, Massachusetts area in around, uh, you know, prior to, to 2011. Um, <clears throat> and so the first part started off with this, uh, both governors of Rhode Island, Massachusetts decided that this would be a, a joint area. So they sometimes referred to as the area of, um, um, area of mutual uh, interest, AMI area. Um, <clears throat> so that was agreed to by the governors in like 2009. Uh, there was over eight task force meetings and you know it's lots of different engagement with stakeholder groups over uh, this initial area that was being discussed um we got uh, uh when we put that out there you know for what a call for information um you know initially does is say is anyone actually interested in leasing this area that's what the name call call for information nominations really comes from is is anyone interested in actually leasing this area and in this area we did have uh we did have interest um both some some of it was unsolicited uh meaning submitted to boem out before we began our planning process and some became some was nominated after through that nominations process um <clears throat> So this is what we actually ended up with our first uh, um, call area. Uh, again, looking at, you know, really beginning to look at some of the, the features that would make um, part of the area undevelopable, uh, you know, major uh, traffic separation scheme, obviously being um, a part of that. Um, and in there, you can also see the different um, proposals, proposal, proposal areas from uh, lessees. So then we start to look at, uh, you know, what other activities are occurring in this area. Um, obviously, you know, fishing in southern New England is, is big. So, we, you know, looked at, uh, you know, fishing, uh, again, vessel transportation, et cetera, as we began this uh, deliberative process. And that one looks like a repeat. Um, and then, you know, Coast Guard, another one of our federal partners, you know, weighs in on, um, you know, what what concerns they might have for uh, marine safety and transportation. And the, the idea here is that this, we continued this slow winnowing process, you know, throughout the development of, of, of this lease area. Here again is uh, some fishing areas prior, uh, prioritized uh, by level of, that level of activity. Uh, we look at, of course, at um, marine mammals, and this one's a right whale density data that we had at, at the time. We looked at visual uh, viewshed issues as well. This is the, the different viewsheds from uh, from shore. Uh, looked at other infrastructure that might already be in place, like existing telecommunications cables. And then finally, we eventually got to, after we looked at all those, we got to, in 2012, we divided the area into two leases. Um, and that's eventually what we ended up with today. Um, the South Fork Wind Farm Project actually is a, then a subset. So is, as I mentioned, you could actually have a lease area, but then you, even within a lease area, you could have a lessee say, I'm gonna actually develop two, two or three projects within a lease area. So this particular lease area, there's one project right now that has uh, gone through the approval process, um, the South Fork Wind Farm Project, uh, that was just a small portion of that northern uh, lease area. And that is one of the projects that we did end up approving. And on January 18th, 2022, and the first pile was driven in July, uh, on July 22nd. So just uh, earlier 
earlier this month. So again, I, I think what was really trying to you know show capture there is you know it's a fairly lengthy process from all the way from you know beginning in 2009 all the way to July 22nd, um, 2023 before we actually uh, started to uh, construct a project. So um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's a lot of a lot of input, a lot of uh, uh, engagement with our federal partners and the, and the public. Uh, throughout the process to to get us where we are today with with actual construction. So that was uh, all for um, my uh, my slides through the my walk through the regulatory process. Um, now we're going to go into agency roles, uh, and I'm going to be the first to talk about Boehm's role in, in in the whole thing. And the reason I I chose um, this particular slide is I do feel oftentimes that it's being the lead federal agency is what which is what BOEM is we're, we're basically the uh, the landlord on the outer continental shelf so um, part of that is that we're the lead to uh, develop the um, the uh, environmental impact uh, assessment for the, for the projects and we also lead the planning and leasing process um, but that also doesn't I, I want to make it clear that that doesn't mean Boehm has authority over other federal agencies' decisions. Um, <clears throat> there's multiple federal and state authorizations that need to occur before a project is constructed. Uh, Boehm is just trying to be the lead, but ultimately, in the end, it, we, you know, Boehm doesn't have any authority over the other agencies' statutory decisions. And I think that slide Betsy had at the very beginning of what ocean planning is trying to do is, you know, they have all these statutes and regulations. How do we, um, you know, try to make that as a coherent process as possible and encourage that collaboration uh, between federal agencies. Uh, some of the key federal agencies that I really want to highlight here is uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In fact, for the Block Island Wind Farm Project, the, the roles were reversed. It was the Army Corps of Engineers that was the lead federal agency because it was in, inside of three miles. And BOEM was a, a co-action agency because we had a role in the export cable. Um, but now in the uh, outside of three miles, it's uh, BOEM is the lead federal agency with the Army Corps of Engineers as a as a cooperating agency, and along with the National Marine Fisheries Service as well um, for their jurisdictions under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, the last thing I want to mention here is that BOEM's lead status then um, is brings the, the project all the way through to that construction. Then on the post construction of the post uh, cop approval process our sister agency the bureau of safety and environmental enforcement takes a lead role in um, enforcing and monitoring uh, lease compliance with BOEM as, as a partner so that's another really uh, another important uh, thing to to raise is Bessie, what we term Bessie's role in this as well so that's all I actually had for the for the BOEM role, there's, I think I covered a lot in, in my slides as far as like the other activities we do, but our role is primarily the, the lead federal agency, which is oftentimes also a big target on our back. That's the image. So Betsy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now for the next slides and just let me know uh, when to- Sounds good. Yeah, I think looking at the time and knowing we have joy and wanting to hear from this really amazing group of participants, I've been scrolling through the participants here, I'm going to keep this to like three or four slides. So Noah's role. So uh, if you could go to the next one. So while BOEM is the lead agency, right, for offshore energy development, <clears throat> Noah is a really proud partner in helping to meet this really important administration goal by providing the foundation of science and stewardship and planning and regulatory responsibilities to ensure that we have offshore wind development that's safe and sustainable and informed um, and all those good things, right? With all those best practices I mentioned. So um, what I'm gonna do is not go into slides on each of these, but just talk about them right here. So this shows you the diversity of our role. What we tried to do here is just pick some pillars, some themes to go across all of NOAA that show you how our NOAA mission maps to wind. Um, and so I'll just start at the top here, protection of coastal and marine resources, right? This has to do with all the environmental reviews. 
that Brian was just speaking to and the regulatory authorizations that I'll show you in a second that where it's our job to ensure that there's compliance with NOAA trust resource statutes um, and that we mit minimize and mitigate potential impacts on other uses, on fisheries, on habitat, et cetera. So that's a really big, that's probably like the lion's share of our effort goes into that first pillar there. The second one, interagency and stakeholder engagement, so important. NOAA takes a lot of pride in our on the ground relationships, whether that's coastal zone management programs or um, sea grant programs, fishing communities, fishery management councils, our own, you know, our sister federal agencies. If we're, we're fanned out, we're in the field, um, and we put a premium on dialogue uh, through ocean partnerships and other groups uh, that we, we definitely contribute to. So that's important to us in a way that we, that we feel like we, we're a real player. Environmental intelligence is the third. I mean, that's kind of our bread and butter, right? It's the data, the tools, the science, the modeling, the mapping, the services that inform where to site wind and how to make those decisions. Um, and, um, and how to uh, make sure that uh, we understand and predict the interactions with other uses and with, with habitats, fisheries, et cetera. And then finally, research and observations, uh, operations rather, um, really kind of picks up the rest of the NOAA mission. And that is, um, gosh, that includes um, meteorological, oceanographic, climate observations, forecasts, science, fishery surveys, um, HF radar, high frequency radar, right? And understanding the impacts that wind could have on all of those things. We've also got the weather service, buddying up with Department of Energy, talking about, you know, hurricane resistant um, turbines and um, high, high, hub height forecasts, right? We need to make sure that this, that these wind farms are um, economically sustainable too. We wanna to understand when that peak energy is happening out there and when to feed it to the grid. So our weather service colleagues are um, really, really key there. All right, next slide, Brian. So like I said, lion's share of our effort really hits on our NOAA statutory roles and responsibilities. Wow, look at them all, right? NOAA is the stewardship agency here and like Brian said, you know, we all have different roles. We have different roles even among our mandates, where in some cases we're the lead with, the, with marine mammals, but in other cases we're the consulting agency, like um, with ESA, MSA, all of these acronyms, right? Sanctuaries Act. And don't forget, well, NEPA is obviously key, right? That's where we, um, we have a, a chance to weigh in on alternatives and impacts, et cetera. But the Coastal Zone Management Act is one that my office actually executes, and that's really different from these others in that that gives the states a really strong voice in being able to review these projects offshore and make sure that they're consistent with the state's enforceable policies approved by NOAA in their coastal zone management program. So another big one in terms of inclusivity and in giving states um, a voice. Next slide, just a couple more. Um, I wanted to include this one just because it maps right to what you were talking about, Brian. So. Again, this, you, you talked about the authorization process. This is what NOAA Fisheries and Ocean Service and Weather Service for that matter is involved with in terms of environmental review. We have a responsibility during that construction and um, operations phase um, to conduct all of these reviews and make sure that we understand the impacts and we're, and we're working very closely with BOEM on those. And again, this is the lion's share. Um, and then next, next slide. Um, this just maps the timeline, just so folks can understand, you know, what I was talking about at the very beginning with ocean planning, really important to have this interagency collaboration. Well, here we have intersections of our, of our mandates, and it's really important to understand that, you know, the notional timeline that NOAA and BOEM agreed to for offshore wind projects is this target of two years between notice of intent and record of decision. And so this is what that looks like. It's fast and furious. Um, and, you know, no one in particular has permitting reviews that are overlaid with a construction operations plan process, but all those dotted lines that you see are all really significant points in time where we have substantial co collaboration between NOAA and BOEM and project developers on preparing draft documents, conducting sufficiency reviews, gathering additional information, et cetera. And you saw how many projects are underway right now from Brian's slides. This is a lot of work. Um, hats off. Hats off to my, my NOAA Fisheries colleagues in particular. Um, and, and we're doing due diligence as the stewardship agency. Next, next slide. Just to wrap, 
Um, there are a lot of other ways that NOAA contributes to wind, right? As I said, it really touches our whole mission. We have a lot to offer here, some of which is upfront, like in the regulatory process, and others, it's it's the spatial modeling that um, we're, we're, we're working in partnership with NOAA, uh, with BOEM on. And um, I know my, my National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science colleagues would love to give a webinar on their site suitability modeling, because it's really, like I said, the next generation marine spatial planning that we're trying to have come alive and really help inform this process. But you can see here just other examples of ways in which NOAA contributes to wind. Think of us as the science, stewardship, research and operations agency for wind, um, really helping to do our part in reaching this administration's goals. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joy. So you can skip forward, Brian, to uh, her slides. All right, thank you, Betsy. Uh, so you, you all might be a little confused that, uh, that my slide talking about DOE's role, um, we also were reflecting vis-a-vis -vis other agencies' roles, since I think it's important for, for everyone to understand that unlike BOEM, NOAA, Army Corps, and others, that um, our role is not regulatory in nature. Uh, what we really are, are, as I mentioned right now, focusing on that 30 gigawatts by 2030 goal and identifying what investments are necessary um, to get there. And the needs are so great. So I spend just as much as of my time uh, prioritizing actions um, that are key. And again, it's all under that those pillars of making sure that we can get to off our offshore wind goals economically, reliably, and timely, just, and sustainably. Uh, and I wanted to mention too that at DOE, most of the funding, unlike NOAA and Betsy's crew of uh, experts, a lot of our research investments do go out to, um, to third parties through competitive solicitations, such as our funding opportunity announcements, our national labs, and then sometimes with our federal agencies interagency agreements. Uh, but again, a key focus of our work is, is where are those gaps? What do we need to achieve those goals? Um, and we try to do a lot of stakeholder outreach and work with our inter uh, with our fellow agencies on, on trying to find out what are the key needs um, to make sure we can get where we're we're all trying to go collaboratively. So um, I don't know if I to jump in. Um, Brian now. Brian, we're not seeing the slide anymore. There we go. Thank you. Thanks. There wasn't much on the slide, so I was going to have Brian do that, but it didn't really matter. So, so thanks, Zach. If you want to change to, oh, and I guess here you can just see that our, our mission is land-based, offshore, and distributed, and we think a lot through technology, R&D, siting challenges, and grid integration. So, uh, so thanks, Zach. If you want to go to questions or whoever is answering those, at least we have 10 minutes. Sure, thank you everybody. So we've had lots of questions come in. At this point, I'll ask the panelists to go ahead and turn their cameras on so we can go ahead and answer some of the questions. Before we jump into questions though, I do want to encourage all of the participants to let us know what else you wanna hear about. Um, we are hold, going to be holding more webinars in the future. So one of the things you can drop into the question box is other topics you'd like us to hold webinars on. We do have a couple tentatively planned. One is on the, uh, the spatial planning process and the other, which I'm sure you all will be happy to hear based on a number of questions about the environmental impact, is on offshore wind development, and marine ecosystem structure and function. So for that reason, I am going to hold off on most of the questions around the environmental impact of wind uh, because we are going to have a webinar specifically about that currently tentatively planned for September. So keep a lookout for that particular webinar. Although I will ask one quick question about this, which I think might have been covered, but just to clarify for our panelists, to which agency does monitor the impacts of offshore wind on environmental resources like marine mammals? You want me to take a start at that one? It's- um, Yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it's 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 several agencies. Um, you know, it, you know, we, we can talk about. Are we talking about? You know, even in state waters, you have the state and and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, in the offshore environment, uh, you know, you have uh, the Bureau of Safety and, and Environmental Enforcement. You have BOEM, and you have the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, like right now, for the uh, projects that are under construction. Um, you know, all the agencies, you know, are, are meeting quite regularly to, you know, not only look at 
uh, you know, protected species uh, observation reports, uh, looking at, you know, um, <clears throat> results of uh, sound field verification, you know, the, the um, sound that's being, you know, put into the environment. It's, it's multi-agency. We're, we're working together and collaboratively in our monitoring of these projects as they're built. Brian, that's great. One thing I would add is, so there's kind of two components here. There's the compliance monitoring, which Brian mentioned with Bessie, and obviously NOAA under their statutory man mandates. The place where DOE comes is, is sort of this big picture impacts monitoring, if you will, and Bowman and DOE uh, did work collaboratively on our latest solicitation and our, our Duke WOW project, for those familiar. And that's looking, there's so many of the impacts of offshore wind that we're still working to characterize that. Um, and, and hoping that that information will inform future sighting. And so, so I think this really transcends all of the agencies depending on the objective. Yeah, yeah. Joy, actually, that's a, that's a great, great thing. I was, the, the, the environmental studies aspect, um, we, we do have several projects that are out there that are funded by the federal government studying this and we'll get, you know, reports, um, you know, available to us from a, a larger, you know, study perspective versus just the compliance. And Betsy, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I was just gonna say, Noah's in the house when it comes to marine mammals, right? We've got, we're the lead agency there and um, that's a big part of our role. There's a lot of studies and um, acoustic work that's going on to, per Brian's point, like a lot of what do we still need to better understand, right? Um, a lot of characterizations and, and uh, you know, trying to get additional funding for, for more acoustic work as well. So um, our marine mammal um, mandate is, is a big part of our contribution. I also have my colleague Sophie on from NIMS. If she wants to drop anything else in the chat um, about MMPA, please do. Great, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. We have a number of inquiries about the public engagement aspect of the permitting process, where that fits in, at what point in the timeline, how, how many times. So uh, would you all mind speaking to that? Um, I can I can take a, a a first crack at it, and I, I tried to really highlight in 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 the slide that you know that's a that with that permitting timeline, there's there's things that are happening you know leading up to even the identification of a of a wind energy area or a lease area. Uh, those are those are all public meetings. There's uh, you know public announcements over, especially on the call for information and nominations and and the lease areas, and we've recently inserted. Uh, draft wind energy area opportunities for comment and um, draft call area opportunities for comment as well. And then once you actually get to fast forward to where we are now with a lot of construction and operation plan reviews, the under the National Environmental Policy Act, there are several opportunities, not only from the, the point of the notice of intent to prepare an EA or an EIS um, and the scoping meetings that are associated with that, but we publish a draft environmental impact statement. Um, we then hold public hearings on that draft environmental impact statement and then develop a, a final environmental impact statement. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, there's just extra things that, that we do, whether we're talking about you know, workshops or meetings like this to try to really uh, provide information about where to find information on, on different projects and the overall process. If I could just add to that, just, just a second. Oh, Joy, I need no, to first, Go ahead, okay. Um, just, yes, BOEM has a lot going on in terms of public process. It's baked right into their process. There's also a lot of, you know, public process and engagement and dialogue outside of those interagency meetings, right? Through ocean partnerships, for example, regional ocean partnerships that are doing a great job of providing those dialogues space. Um, through Sea Grant, that's doing quite a bit of, of, of work, um, socioeconomic impact work on fishing communities and really getting out into, into the field um, and talking to people about perceptions and impact, et cetera. So there's lots of different ways. And then states, of course, do quite a bit of their own um, uh, engagement within their own jurisdictions as part of the bone process as well and bring that to, you know, all of that input to the, the interagency um, Bone processes, and so there's a there's a lot of of um, there's a lot of discussion, which is so important to happen both about a particular project, but also like I was talking about at the beginning on this larger landscape of ocean uses, where of which wind is a big part, 
right? So just wanted to mention that there's opportunity there um, informally and formally. Yeah, Betsy, you know, I was going to say the same thing. Again, DOE, we're not, we're not in a project-specific space, uh, but we have been supporting the, the NOAA Sea Grant effort, which I really wanted to, to like emphasize because these universities are based across the coast, they're community members, and so we're trying to amplify their capacity. So community members understand after when, understand the process before uh, the BOEMS formal process even kicks off. Great, thank you all. Um, a timely question. We have a question asking about permitting reform related to the Inflation Reduction Act, given that there is a large amount of permitting reform uh, as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm wondering if any of that applies to some of the processes that you all have talked about today related to offshore wind. Yeah, Betsy, you wanna um i know i don't i mean I, we mentioned a lot of the the work that bohm is doing and, and whether it's per it's, it's not inflation related to the inflation reduction act but we have the the fast 41 um you know timelines that we're working on the two-year reviews um and then we i think there's money that and i bring that up because it's the uh federal infrastructure permitting Council, I hope I'm getting that right. FIPSI um, is the one I think that received a lot of that permitting reform uh, funding to help support uh, that work. So um, anyway, we, we I don't I'm not aware of anything that, that any um, rules that BOEM is promulgating on on that side of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act right now. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question asking about unsolicited lease proposals. They note that those weren't necessarily mentioned, uh, but they're aware of at least one or two in Washington. So they're wondering if we can speak a little bit to unsolicited lease proposals and where those fit into the process and agency roles. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, yeah, under the BOEMS regulations, there is the opportunity to evaluate an, an unsolicited uh, lease. However, one of the first steps in, in an unsolicited lease, if we decide to move forward with uh, that, is to see if there's competitive interest. So the first the first step is to say, uh, someone proposed a you know to use this area of the outer continental shelf as a as a uh, as a renewable energy site. Um, is anyone else interested in there in that same in doing something similar in that same area? And the moment that an additional um, uh, entity says yes i'm actually interested in developing something in that same general area as well then we go into the competitive lease uh process which is generally the, the same process that we've used uh for uh all of our projects i think there's only one project that we did um have a a non-competitive lease sale and that was offshore uh, uh delaware maryland area um back in that 2011 time frame that we were talking about but most in the, the conditions now are generally that most of our leases are going through that competitive lease process fantastic we have had a number of clarifying questions come in uh brian they noted that you that you noted that the pilings were driven 72323 which has not occurred yet. Uh, people wondering whether or not that was meant to be June or if that's the plan. I'm sorry, that was a typo on mine had given. It was June, sorry. So if we can, uh, again, late last month. Uh, and uh, yes, that was a typo. I will fix that. Great, thank you. Uh, we figured that, I think the participants figured that was the case, but wanted to clarify that in the last minute that we had. So I do want to thank all of our panelists and all of our attendees. We, of course, had many questions that we were unable to get to. They will be passed on to the panelists, and they may be able to answer some of those directly. Additionally, uh, noting that there were a lot of questions on topics that are related to offshore wind, we are planning on holding 
a number of different webinars in this series. So thank you all for your input into other topics that we can cover. We will definitely be looking at those. And as a reminder, as I mentioned earlier, we have tentatively planned our next webinar to be on offshore wind development and marine ecosystem structure and function. It's tentatively scheduled for September 21st. Don't hold me to that because we haven't nailed down the date and time yet, but do keep an eye on the OCTO listserv, the National Marine Protected Area Center webinar page, and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries webinar page for more information about that upcoming webinar. So with that, once again, I want to thank our fantastic panelists and thank you all for attending. This has been a fantastic and fascinating webinar and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thanks.